the night of August 9, 1969, Charles Manson, a 35-year-old cult leader, instructed four members of his recruited cultists to drive to 10050 Shallow Drive and kill every individual inside of the residence. The individuals given the brutal task by Manson were 24-year-old baggage handler Tex Swatson, 22-year-old college dropout and processing clerk Patricia Krenwinkel, Susan Atkins, a 21-year-old college student with a growing obsession for Manson, and lastly, Linda Kasabian, a 20-year-old homeless single mother of two looking for a way to support herself and baby. A similar denominator amongst all these individuals were their desire to prove their loyalty to Manson and live an unconventional lifestyle with no regard towards authority. The crime that took place that night is recorded as one of the most brutal events in American history and forever instilled a sense of fear to the residents of Los Angeles County in 1969. Manson was born Charles Mill Maddox on November 12, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio to Kathleen Maddox, a 16-year-old girl who was both an alcoholic and prostitute. Kathleen later married William Manson, but the marriage ended quickly and Charles was placed at an all-boys school at the age of 12. Rejected in his attempts to return to his mother, Manson was soon living on the streets and getting by through various criminal activity. Over the next 20 years of his young adult life, Manson spent most of his time in and out of prisons until March of 1967 when he moved to San Francisco before ultimately ending up in Los Angeles in the summer of that same year. Back in February 1969, the Manson family planned to create and record an album whose songs would trigger the racial war between white and black people that Manson was erroneously predicting. When the Manson family were told Terry Melcher was to come to the house to hear the material, the woman prepared a meal and organized the camp for their lucrative opportunity. But Melcher never arrived. Melcher was an American record producer who expressed false interest in Manson's music but ultimately failed to cultivate any of Manson's ideas. This is integral to the story as it serves as a catalyst for Manson's initial motive for the crimes that transpired that August summer night. It wouldn't be until May 18, 1969, that Terry Melcher visited one of the family ranches to hear Manson and his family of cultists sing. Melcher arranged a subsequent visit, but ultimately none of the recordings were ever used in the production of any music. On March 23, 1969, Manson trespassed onto the 10050 Shallow Drive property he had previously known as Terry Melcher's residence. As of February 1969, Melcher was no longer the tenant and the new inhabitants of the home were Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. Manson was initially greeted by Sharok Atami, an Iranian photographer and a friend of Sharon Tate. Hatimi was there to photograph Tate prior to her departure for Rome the next day. Having seen Manson through a window as Manson approached the main entrance of the home, Hatami had gone onto the front porch to ask him why he was there. When Manson told Hatami he was looking for Terry Melcher, Hatami informed him that the residence now belonged to the Polanskis. Hatami advised Manson to take the back entrance of the property leading to the guest house to see if the current occupant could be a better assistance to him. Concerned and vigilant over the trespasser on their property, Tate asked Hatami what Manson wanted and expressed feelings of unsettlement after seeing Manson's demeanor and behavior. Hatami told Tate a strange man was looking for someone he had never heard of before. Hatami and Tate maintained their confusion and concern while Manson made his way back towards the back of the property. Manson re-emerged about a minute later and left the residence without saying a single word. That same evening, Manson returned to the property and went directly to the guest house located in the backyard. He stealthily entered the property, undetected by Tate, and spoke with Rudy Atobelli, the current property owner and landlord to Tate and Polanski. Speaking through a screen door, Altobelli gave false information to Manson and informed him that Terry Melcher had moved to Malibu. He lied and said he didn't know Melcher's new address or exact current whereabouts. In response to a direct question from Altobelli, Manson explained that he had been directed to the guest house by the tenants on the main property. This statement from Manson irritated Altobelli. He expressed his frustration towards the situation and requested that Manson not disturb his tenants. Manson leaves the property but doesn't discard the notion that there are other celebrities currently residing in the home. The next day, Tate asked Altobelli whether, quote, that creepy looking guy had gone back to the guest house the day before. This statement from Tate could have been preemptive concern towards the impending events that would later take her life. Shortly after midnight on August 9, 1969, all four aforementioned Manson family members drove into the Hollywood Hills in pursuit of carrying out their assigned objective. 
Luckily for Roman Polanski, the director of Rosemary's Baby, he was temporarily residing on the Shallow Drive property but was out of town directing a film. His eight-month pregnant wife and established actress, 26-year-old Sharon Tate, was relaxing at home with her close friends. None of them had any tangible or sentimental connection to Manson other than being physically in the home previously occupied by one of Manson's former business connects. Manson's diabolical plan was set in place. Manson directed Tex Watson to take Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel to the Shallow Drive property, he told the women to do exactly as Watson would instruct them to do. When the four members of the Manson team arrive at the entrance of the Shallow Drive property, Watson climbed a telephone pole near the gate and cut the phone line. The family members strategically parked their car at the bottom of the hill to remain inconspicuous. Thinking the gate might be electrified or rigged with an alarm, they climbed a brush embankment near the entrance and were able to easily make their way onto the grounds. At that moment, headlights began to shine from a nearby corner of the property's driveway. Watson ordered Charlie's girls to lie in the bushes and remain silent. This is when Watson abruptly steps out of the brush and orders the approaching driver to stop his vehicle. The driver in question was an 18-year-old student named Stephen Parent. Earlier that evening, Stephen Parent got off work and was driving his dad's 1966 AMC Rambler. Parent heads up Shallow Drive and Benedict Canyon at around 11.45 p.m. Parent meets with a friend to show him an AM, FM, Sony Digimatic clock radio he wishes to sell him. Parent's friend happens to be living in the guest house on the Shallow Drive property. The buyer ultimately declines to buy the radio from Parent. At around 12.15 a.m., Parent starts his car and heads towards the exit gate. He rolls down the window to use a push-button gate opener as an unfamiliar figure approaches him. It is later revealed to be Tets Watson with a buck knife in one hand and a 22 caliber in the other. Parent pleads with Watson and says, please don't hurt me. Watson begins slashing the knife against Parent's skin, giving him a defensive slash wound on the palm of his hand. Severing several of his tendons, he then shoots Parent four times in the chest and abdomen. Within minutes, Tex Watson and the three other women enter the main house at the Shallow Drive property and plan to kill everyone in sight. Watson ordered the women to help push Parent's car further up the driveway as a precaution to not draw attention to their suspicious activities. After scouring the front lawn and having Linda Kasabian search for an open window, Watson successfully cuts a window screen off and tells Kasabian to keep watch by the entrance gate. Kasabian walked over to Stephen Parent's hidden rambler and waited for further instruction. Watson enters through the aforementioned window and lets Atkins and Krenwinkel in through the front door. As Watson whispered to Atkins, film producer Wojtek Frykowski is the first guest to unexpectedly wake up on the living room couch. When Frykowski asked him who he was and what he was doing there, Watson replied, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. Going off Watson's further instruction, Atkins finds the house's three other occupants and brings them to the living room with the assistance of Patricia Krenwinkel. Watson began to tie Tate and Sebring together by their necks with the rope he had brought with him to facilitate his plan. Sebring begins to struggle and briefly protests the rough treatment of the pregnant Tate. Watson shoots and kills Sebring point blank. Folger was taken momentarily back to her bedroom for her purse, out of which she gave the intruder $70. After that, Watson stabbed the groaning Folger seven times until she died. Varkowski's hands had been previously bound with a towel. Varkowski manages to free himself and begins struggling with Susan Atkins. Next, Varkowski struggles to move across the lawn after being stabbed and tormented by Watson. Watson murders Varkowski with a final frenzy of manic serial stabbings. Unbelievably so, Frykowski was stabbed a total of 51 times by Watson. Charlie's followers were leaving nothing to chance and wanted the slayings to be as newsworthy and controversial as possible. Around this time, Linda Kasabian steps into the front entrance of the home from the driveway after hearing the quote, horrifying sounds coming from Tate's home. In a vain and haphazardous attempt to halt the massacre, she told Atkins false information that a guard was coming. Inside the house, Folger had managed to escape from Krenwinkel's grip and fled out the bedroom door to the pool area. Folger was pursued to the front lawn by Krenwinkel, who ultimately catches, tackles, and stabs Folger. Watson then takes over for Krenwinkel and brutally stabs Folger a cumulative total of 28 times. Back in the main home, actress Sharon Tate pleads to be allowed to live long enough to have her baby, and even offered herself as a hostage in an attempt to save the life of her unborn child. Her killers ignored all pleas and cries from Tate, never factually confirmed or documented, either Atkins, Watson, or both simultaneously killed Tate, stabbing her a total of 16 times. In initial confessions to cellmates, Susan Atkins would say that she killed Tate. 
In later statements to her attorney and before a grand jury, Atkins indicated Tate had been stabbed solely by Tex Watson. In his 1978 autobiography, Watson said that he stabbed Tate and that Atkins never touched her. Watson later wrote that Tate cried, mother, mother, as she was being murdered and passing away. Her unborn child dying with her as a result of her fatal injuries. With all the murders now completed, Charlie's girl still had one more task to do before leaving the residence. Manson instructed them to, quote, leave a sign, something witchy. Using the towel that they had bound Frykowski's hands, Susan Atkins wrote pig on the house's front door in Tate's blood. This was an attempt by Manson to leave a sign of the impending racial war that was allegedly going to take place any day now. On their way back to the ranch, Tets and Charlie's girls changed out of their bloody clothes, discarded them in the Hollywood Hills, and disposed of their murder weapons. The Polanski's housekeeper, Winifred Chapman, had arrived for work that morning and discovered the bodies of all individuals. The next night, six Manson family members rode out per Manson's further instruction. Displeased by the panic of the victims at Shello Drive, Manson accompanied the six members to, quote, show them how to do it. After a few hours of endless driving, Manson considered a number of murders and even attempted one of them. Manson gave Kasabian directions that brought the group to 3301 Waverly Drive. According to Atkinson Kasabian, Manson disappeared up the driveway to the LeBianca's home and returned to say he had tied up the house's occupants. As Watson retells the events of that night, he claims Manson roused the sleeping Leno LaBianca from the couch at gunpoint and had Watson bind the husband's hands with a leather thong. After Rosemary LaBianca was brought briefly into the living room, Watson followed Manson's instruction to cover the couple's heads with pillowcases. The pillowcases were secured around their necks by using lamp cords as a makeshift rope to ensure the victims were properly confined. Manson then allegedly instructs Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Houten to kill the bound up husband and wife. Watson complained to Manson of the inadequacy of the previous night's weapons used on Tate and her guests. To maliciously elevate the gruesome factor, Watson went to the living room and began stabbing Leno LaBianca with a chrome-plated bayonet. The bayonet is a knife, sword, or spike-shaped weapon designed to fit on the end of the muzzle of a rifle or similar lengthy firearm. This transforms the blade of the knife into a spear-like weapon that allows the user to strike at a greater distance from their target. The first thrust went directly into La Bianca's throat, but sounds of a scuffle in the nearby bedroom drew Watson away from his victim to discover Mrs. La Bianca struggling to break free of her restraints. As she struggles, La Bianca is subdued with several stabs of the bayonet. Watson then returns to the living room and resumes attacking Mr. La Bianca. A brief period of time elapses when Watson finds Krenwinkle stabbing Rosemary La Bianca with the knife she found in the kitchen. Krenwinkle was following through with Manson's instruction to make sure each of the women played a part in the murders. Watson Watson told Van Houten to stab Mrs. LaBianca too. Van Houten followed her orders and stabs Rosemary approximately 16 times in the back of her exposed buttocks. At the trial, Van Houten claimed that Rosemary LaBianca was dead when she began to viciously stab her. Evidence confirmed that many of Mrs. LaBianca's 41 stab wounds had been inflicted post-mortem or after she had died. While Watson cleaned off the bayonet and showered, Krenwinkel wrote the words rise and death to pigs on the walls and helter skelter on the refrigerator door, all in the LaBianca's blood. Aside from the bayonet's inflicted wounds, Krenwinkel gave Leno LaBianca 14 stab wounds with an ivory-handled carving kitchen fork, which she purposely left popping out of Mr. LaBianca's stomach. She also planted a steak knife in his throat to create more controversy regarding the murders from the previous night. Assuming the Tate murders were the consequence of a Hollywood drug deal gone wrong, the authorities ignored a lot of signs or clues from other crimes with eerily similar circumstances. William Gerritsen, the young man temporarily residing in the guest home who was visited by Stephen Parent the night of the murders, was held briefly as a Tate murder suspect. Gerritsen told police he had neither seen nor heard anything on the night of the murders. He was then released from custody on August 11, 1969 after undergoing a polygraph examination that indicated he had not been involved in the crimes. The La Bianca crime scene was discovered at about 10.30 p.m. on August 10, 1969, approximately 19 hours after the murders were committed. August 12, 1969, the LAPD told the press it had ruled out any connection between the Tate and La Bianca homicides. A report written at the end of August documented a possible connection between the bloody writings at La Bianca's house and the Beatles' most recent album. The difference in age of the La Bianca detectives made the younger individuals more adept at picking up social cues that Manson and his followers were attempting to communicate through their various murders. Still working separately from the Tate detective team, 
The LaBianca team checked with the sheriff's office in mid-October about possible similar crimes. On August 16th, the sheriff's office raided Span Branch and arrested Manson and 25 of his followers as suspects in a major auto theft ring. The family members had begun stealing Volkswagens and converting them into dune buggies. Weapons were seized and the raiders found stolen dune buggies and other vehicles on the ranch properties. A dormitory mate of Susan Atkins succeeded in informing LAPD of Susan's involvement in the crime and more pertinent details regarding the Manson family. Transferred to Sybil Brandt Institute, a detention center in Los Angeles, she had begun talking to bunkmates Ronnie Howard and Virginia Graham about all the Manson murders she was involved in. On December 1, 1969, acting on the information from the sources provided by Atkins, LAPD announced warrants for the arrest of Watson, Krenwinkel, and Kasabian for the murder of Sharon Tate. The trial began on June 15, 1970. The prosecution's main witness was Kasabian, who along with Manson, Atkins, and Krimwinkel had been individually charged with seven counts of murder and one count of conspiracy. Originally, a deal had been made with Susan Atkins in which the prosecution agreed not to seek the death penalty against her in exchange for her grand jury testimony on which the indictments were secured. Originally, Judge William King had reluctantly granted Manson permission to act as his own attorney. Because of Manson's conduct, including violations of a gag order and submission of outlandish and nonsensical pretrial motions, the permission was withdrawn before his trial even started. Manson filed an affidavit of prejudice against Judge King, who was replaced by Judge Charles H. Older. On Friday, July 24, 1970, the first day of testimony, Manson appeared in court with an X carved into his forehead. He issued a statement that he was considered inadequate and incompetent to speak or defend himself, and had X'd himself from the establishment's world. Over the following weekend, the female defendants duplicated the mark on their own foreheads, which was later replaced by a swastika sign on Manson's forehead. During the trial, Manson's family members loitered near the entrances and corridors of the courthouse. To keep them out of the courtroom itself, the prosecution subpoenaed them as prospective witnesses who would not be able to enter while others were testifying. On October 5, 1970, Manson was denied the court's permission to question a prosecution witness whom the defense attorneys had declined to cross-examine. Leaping over the defense table, Manson attempted to attack the judge. Wrestled to the ground by bailiffs, he was removed from the courtroom along with the female defendants who had subsequently risen and began chanting in Latin. Thereafter, Judge Older allegedly began wearing a revolver underneath his rope. On November 16, 1970, the prosecution rested its case. Three days later, after arguing standard dismissal motions, the defense stunned the court by rejecting any testimony from any witness belonging to the Manson family. Shouting their disapproval, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Manhutten demanded their right to testify. In chambers, the women's lawyers told the judge their clients wanted to testify as they had solely planned and committed the crimes allegedly without Manson's involvement or influence. This was an obvious and desperate attempt by Manson's brainwashed followers to take any culpability off of Manson. Manson. By arresting their case, the defense lawyers tried to stop their last-minute defense tactic. The prosecutors were well aware that this was a ploy by Manson who was advising the woman to testify in this way as a means of saving him. The next day, Manson testified by making statements implicating his co-defendants. The jury was promptly removed from the courtroom. On January 25, 1971, guilty verdicts were returned against the four defendants on each of the 27 separate counts against them. Not far into the trial's penalty phase, the jurors saw the haphazard defense that Manson had planned to present. Midway through the penalty phase, Manson shaved his head and trimmed his beard to a fork. He told the press, I am the devil and the devil always has a bald head. The female defendants refrained from shaving their heads until the jurors retired to weigh the state's request for the death penalty. The effort to exonerate Manson via the copycat scenario failed. And on August 29, 1971, the jury returned verdicts of death against all four defendants on all counts. On April 19, 1971, Judge Older officially sentenced the four individuals to death. Protracted proceedings to extradite Watson from his native Texas hometown, which he had resettled a month before his arrest, resulted in him being tried separately. The trial began in August of 1971, and by October, Watson had been found guilty on seven counts of murder and one count of conspiracy. Unlike the others, Watson had presented a psychiatric defense. Prosecutor Vincent Baglosi made short work of Watson's insanity claims. Ultimately, all claims or attempts failed as Watson was also sentenced to death. 
In February 1972, the death sentences of all five parties were automatically reduced to life in prison sentences by California v. Anderson, the case in which the California Supreme Court abolished the death penalty in the entire state. After his return to prison, Manson's rhetoric and hippie speeches were not accepted. Though he eventually found temporary acceptance from the Aryan Brotherhood, his role was submissive to a sexually aggressive member of the group at San Quentin Prison. On September 25, 1984, while in prison at the California Medical Facility, facility at Vacaville, Manson was severely burned by a fellow inmate who poured paint thinner on him and set him on fire. Despite suffering second and third degree burns over 20% of his body, Manson recovered from his injuries. In prison, Atkins embraced Christianity and apologized for her role in the crimes, and the prison staff advocated unsuccessfully for her release in 2005. She was denied parole a total of 13 times. She married twice while in prison before ultimately being diagnosed with brain cancer in 2008. She appealed to the prison system and the parole officials for a compassionate release, but the state parole board denied the request. Susan Atkins died in prison in 2009 on September 24, 2009 at the Central California Women's Facility in Chochilla, California. Patricia Kernwinkle was a secretary when she met Manson at a party. She quit her job the next day and joined Manson's family. She was found guilty of seven counts of murder in the killings, including stabbing the LeBlancas to death and writing death to pigs on the walls of the victims in their blood. In a 2014 interview with the New York Times, Krenwinkel reminisces on her decisions and says, What a coward that I found myself to be when I look at that situation. The thing I try to remember sometimes is that what I am today is not who I was when I was 19. After Atkins' death, Krenwinkel, now 71, became California's longest serving female inmate. According to state prison officials, Krenwinkel is a model inmate involved in rehabilitated programs at the prison. She is being housed at the California Institution for Women in Chino, California. Krenwinkel was denied parole again in 2017. She will be eligible to apply for parole again in 2022. Van Houten said she was introduced to Manson by a boyfriend and came to view him as Jesus Christ. She is currently serving her life sentence at the California Institution for Women in Corona, California. Prison officials say she has been disciplinary free her entire sentence and even admitted to a parole board in 2002 that she was deeply ashamed of her role in the killings. Quote, I take very seriously not just the murders, but what made me make myself available to someone like Manson. California Governor Gavin Newsom overruled the parole's board decision to free Van Houten in June of 2019. It was the third time a governor had intervened and stopped the release of the youngest member of Manson's murderous cult. Former Governor Jerry Brown previously denied her release twice. A state review board recommended parole for her in 2016, but Brown reversed that decision. He said there is some evidence that Van Houten still presents an unreasonable threat to society. Linda Kasapian drove the killers to where the Tate and LaBlanca murders occurred and went along with the plan since she was the only member with a valid driver's license. She did not actively participate in the killings and in exchange for immunity became Buglosi's star witness during the trial. Kasabian ended up with a Manson group after she left an unhappy marriage when she was 21. She took her baby daughter and followed a friend to Manson Spawn Ranch. There she became romantically involved with Watson, a devoted member of the family, until she fled shortly after the LeBlanca murders. As of 1994, Kasabian was a mother of four and believed to be living on the East Coast. Charles Tetz Watson, Manson's self-described right-hand man, was sentenced to death for his part in the killings but was later given life in prison after the death penalty was overturned. In prison, Watson married, divorced, and fathered four children and became an ordained minister. His participation in the 1969 Manson murders is a part of history that he deeply regrets. Watson, 73, is housed at the R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California near the Mexican border. He has been denied parole 17 times. A state panel in 2016 once again found him unsuitable for release from prison for at least five more years. Manson had hundreds of prison violations and had gotten in trouble for having a cell phone and a homemade weapon while incarcerated. Manson was denied parole 12 times. His next parole hearing was scheduled for 2027. On January 3, 2017, Manson was taken from prison to a hospital for an undisclosed medical issue. One source said he was seriously ill but couldn't provide specific information. He died from cardiac arrest resulting from respiratory failure and colon cancer at the hospital four days later on November 19, 2017 at the age of 83. Although her career and motherhood were abruptly stolen from her, Sharon's legacy still has an echoing effect on today's popular culture and impact on Hollywood history. It's been more than 50 years since the movie star's passing at the age of 26, but Tate's undeniable beauty and star power make her a recurring subject for many roles in popular culture. 
Kate has been portrayed by actress Katie Cassidy in the 2016 horror film Wolves at the Door. In 2017, Rachel Roberts played Tate in the seventh season of American Horror Story Cult. In 2018, director Daniel Ferens confirmed he was working on an adaptation film titled The Haunting of Sharon Tate, with Hilary Duff playing the late pregnant actress. A link to the film will be available in the description box of this video directing you to Amazon.com, but I encourage you to only watch it if the film is free. Even more recently and skillfully, Margot Robbie portrayed Tate in the 2019 film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood directed by Quentin Tarantino. Kate Bosworth is also rumored to be playing the role of Tate in the upcoming Screen Gems biopic, which will be directed by Michael Polish and is scheduled to be filmed in 2020. Though her career and experience as a mother were short-lived, Sharon Tate is still fondly remembered as a good-natured and extremely beautiful person who wanted to be respected for her skill and craft as an actor. But most of all, Tate was looking forward to having a family, settling down with Roman, working less, and enjoying life's successes in her expected motherhood. At the time of filming this video, Sharon Tate would have been 76 years old, while her unborn child would have been 50 years old had it not been for that horrific night in August of 1969.